Hello, I'm Maria Banos Jordan, president and founder of the Texas Familias Council. And our mission is to support families and encourage and inspire healthy and inclusive communities in our Texas area. We've been working very hard over the past three years uh, addressing the needs of our families through the pandemic. And today we're very blessed to have Ella Ewart Pierce. Uh, she is the Regional Minority Health Analyst uh, with Region 6, of the Office of Regional Health Operations, um, part of the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, she has been very, very gracious in sharing uh, vital information with our council on what is happening around uh, our state and our communities pertaining to um, the pandemic and other health issues that are very, very much part of the needs of our community. So I asked her to share some points with us today. Um, she obviously has a wealth of, of knowledge and information on how our vulnerable communities are proceeding to uh, deal with the transitions that we've had to go through several surges of the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic and overall general public health issues that continue to affect to our communities today. So thank you, Ella, for being with us today. Thank you, really appreciate the opportunity. It's an honor Absolutely. and pleasure. No, thank you so much. So so um, before we get started, do you mind just sharing a little bit about your role in, in your position? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name's Ella Ewart Pierce. I'm the Regional Minority Health Analyst in um, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health in Region 6. So I'm located in Dallas, and our region includes um, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana, and, and 68 federally recognized tribes that are located in that region. Um, and we really do a lot to uh, convene and make connections and promote um, resources from the Department of Health and Human Services and really try to focus on the public health priorities of our region at this, at the moment. So you've been pretty, pretty busy the past three years then? Yes, I think so <laughs> many of us have. Yeah, it's been a busy few years. So, um, well, we talked a little bit before uh, about our communities and some of the the needs that we've been seeing. Um, and I think especially when it comes to public health, there's been so many lessons that have come out of this pandemic, both for families, but also for community-based organizations that have had to adapt to the needs of their communities. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, after three years in the in the pandemic, what's been the greatest lesson in reaching the underserved communities with public health and vaccination information? What have you taken away from this? Yeah, that's such a great question. Thanks. So I think a few important ideas really stand out for reaching underserved communities, typically minority communities um, with more limited access and connection to health services. So, and the first, um, and I'm sure you've heard this before, you are this really, uh, is to maintain relationships with trusted messengers. So trusted messengers are critical. And what I mean by that is um, public health needs to nurture these really essential relationships in an ongoing way when during an emergency and during our just day-to-day -day regular time um, to best meet community members where they are. So it's a listen first to ensure that messages are culturally relevant, um, incorporate values that really resonate with the audience, um, and trusted messengers are people like family members. There are individual care providers, particularly pediatricians, um, community health workers, faith leaders. There are people from your community who often look and speak like you. The second really critical component, um, I, I think we've seen this so much is to demonstrate cultural humility. Um, Cultural humility is a path to getting to culturally and linguistically appropriate care for diverse communities of, of all types. So cultural humility requires um, openness and self-reflection over the lifespan. You're never finished with your, with your cultural humility journey. Um, it means empathy. It means being others oriented. Um, and it really requires acknowledging power imbalances and uh, institutional accountability when those are not being met. So for example, we saw um, national disparities in vaccine uptake in communities of color, 
particularly. And so health departments in Texas and elsewhere started looking for ways to get to the people who were not being served. Um, and there are two great examples. San Antonio Metro began a program um, funded by the Office of Minority Health in part to improve health literacy. So just like understanding of health systems and being able to identify misinformation, that kind of thing. Uh, that, that program is called Confianza and it has been very successful. Um, another example, Houston, did a really deep dive into some data called um, social the social vulnerability index, pairing it with other data sets to kind of use locally at a zip code level. And I know that doesn't sound just earth shattering, but to look at com your community at a zip code level is really powerful and not, um, not as common as you would hope. Um, so Houston was able to really target their outreach by zip code because that's how they looked at the data and we really see disparities by zip code. So that was just really two really great examples. And then lastly, um, I think we've learned we have to confront misinformation. This was such a barrier during the um, pandemic. The Surgeon General actually put out a report about it called Confronting Health Misinformation. Um, and it has four things that I just really want to highlight. One is learn how to identify and avoid sharing it. <laughs> Don't be part of the problem. Um, engage with your friends and family. This is hard. You know, this is like bringing up things that can cause conflict at the dinner table. But in order to keep our family safe and healthy, we have to call it out when we see it. And then addressing it not only within our families, but in our communities. So... Those are kind of three things. I We've done some webinars in our region about misinformation that I can share if, if y'all want to see them later. Uh, I, that's such a such an important point to make. And uh, and I hope we don't forget that point going forward, even as the you know, this this uh, pandemic is calming down um, because uh, because I think that that's going to be an ongoing um challenge for communities is sifting through so much information, uh, the rumor mills, um, and then just being up to date on the facts, the science-driven facts that, you know, are coming out just related to public health in general. So thank you for making those points. Um, so now today, you know, we, I, I think it's safe to say we're, we're kind of on the downslide of, of, you know, kind of the height of the pandemic mm -hmm. and hopefully we continue down, down this trajectory. Um, but there's a small percentage of the population that is currently uh, being boosted. So with the bivalent vaccine, what do you think is the, the contributing factor to the hesitation in taking that booster? Yeah, so we have really good data about this actually from the CDC. They do a report called the State of Vaccine Confidence Insights Report um, on a regular basis. And they also map locations of vaccine hesitancy. So you can actually look at you know your community and see what your kind of rate is. Um, but we know that the rates where a lot of us live are not great. So um, the kind of critical question is like, what can we do about it? Um, and I think CBOs just play a really critical role here. We, you know, we have to continue to leverage those trusted messengers and understand who they are for our particular community. Um, healthcare, public health leaders, community leaders, we really just have to get everybody on board and maintaining those relationships again in normal times as well as emergency times. Um, so the availability, the eligibility, the safety, and the effectiveness of that updated bivalent dose, um, we, we have to promote that. So disseminating that da data about the effectiveness and the safety um, is, again, available at the CDC. There's a really good um, morbidity and mortality weekly report report, which I know is not the publication that's on your bedside table probably, but um, December 2nd edition has, yeah. has the data about um, efficacy that I think, you know, if, if you're the leader of an organization, you might be interested in uh, confirming for yourself what you think um, with, you know, the real data. 
then I think the other thing we have to do is create venues like you're doing here, which this um, social media campaign that y'all do is so, so fantastic. But venues and mechanisms to respond to community questions and concerns. Not everybody's concern is the same, you know, and not everybody's reason for getting the vaccine is the same. So I love these types of forums. I think they're so effective. And then um, the other thing that we can do is understand the COVID vaccine with the flu vaccine, you yeah. know, work with trusted messengers to disseminate messaging about getting both of those at the same time. Um, the next step for uh, the CDC is time to move in that direction of having like an annual vaccine. Um, perhaps it's not not certain yet, but that does seem to be part of the discussion that's happening. Right. Yes. I mean, we you know we are continuing to push for uh, well, some of those uh, folks that still have not maybe gotten those first and second rounds of the vaccine. Uh, we're still trying to make it accessible to them while we can, and then. Uh, certainly encourage, especially our vulnerable communities, those with, um, you know, underlying health conditions and uh, uh, other other issues. Um, you know, we we're I I guess we're going to still continue to see these um, the evolution of this COVID virus, uh, this coronavirus over over uh, you know years maybe, and so we have to be vigilant and make sure that our families are getting the right information and and have yeah. access to it. So. Um, Definitely. Absolutely. That um, if I could just add, I think folks like concretely need to know that the vaccines are free. They should not be ha having to pay for them. Um, you can find where you can go at vaccines.gov. Um, so if you put in your address, you can find a place close to you. And then, um, you know, in terms of concerns about safety and efficacy, we have to respond to that with data. You know, we can't rely on the social media misinformation or just hearsay, you know. Um, and so we know, I'm just going to give you a little sneak peek into that December 2nd morbidity and mortality weekly report. But um, for persons who previously received two, three, or even four doses of the the old kind of vaccine, the monovalent vaccine, um, that immunity wanes with time. And the benefit of the bivalent booster increases with time since receipt of the most recent monovalent dose. So the longer it's been since you've had your last dose, the more effective um, the bivalent, the new kind of vaccine is going to be. Um, and even if you've had four vaccines, um, the, if you haven't had the, the bivalent, it can still really benefit you. you it a, still is protective against. That's, that's a huge a huge point, I think that, you know, and, and uh, that messaging is important to continue to get out there because I think uh, um, a lot of times what we see in our communities is if the messaging is not um, consistent, if it's not uh, present, um, people are uh, interpreting that as it's no longer an, an issue or a yeah. need um, or, or, you know, or we've moved on beyond, uh, beyond COVID, but the reality is people are still getting sick and, um, you know, having risk factors. So it's important uh, to, to, you know, continue this messaging and, and let them know. Um, so the impact on uh, of the pandemic, uh, like you mentioned, uh, we've, we've so many lessons with misinformation, um, but uh, the other big one has been mental health. Uh, we've seen that a lot. Uh, I think it's, um, I would I would almost say that right now, currently in our outreach efforts, that is what we're running into, um, mm -hmm. you know, on, on larger and larger scales, um, whether it be with children or families, uh, marriages, um, e even, even a lot of our, uh, you know, frontline workers and, you know, social workers, people that have been out there for three years nonstop, um, mm -hmm. the burnout or the, just the difficulty in, in, in trying to kind of get rebooted and, and, you know, move forward from, from the, the height of the pandemic has been difficult. Um, how do you, do you believe that uh, currently our community-based organizations are mobilizing effectively to address this? Or um, what is, you know, what, what do you think is needed most right now in, in kind of 
identifying mental health issues and needs? And then, you know, what can we do at the local level? Yeah, such an important issue. I mean, the mental health crisis is staring us in the face. It's um, including issues like suicide, substance use disorders, violence in homes, violence in our communities. Um, CBOs are doing a lot. They are mobilizing effectively to address some of the need, but the problem is that the need is expansive and growing and it's just a huge challenge to keep up with. So I think, you know, our community members and our CBOs need help. Um, we know there was a recent SAMHSA report that said um, SAMHSA is the um, Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration for HHS. And they had a recent report that said 25% of substance users um, who want to stop can't afford the cost of treatment. Um, so, you know, we saw in Texas, um, provisional data like uh, 2021 to 2022 show that we had a more than 10% increase in drug overdose deaths um, just in Texas. In Oklahoma, that data shows 22% increase. Wow. So it's, it's tough right now. Um, one resource that we can promote the, is the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, so that's a number folks can call 24 seven, call, text, chat, um, and you can access trained like crisis counselors there. Um, it's set up to help people who are experiencing suicidal um, thoughts and um, substance use, just mental health crisis or other just emotional distress. Um, you can call 988 if you're worried about a loved one experiencing a crisis. Um, and the, the, the goal is to get that individual connected with services. So that's a, a new resource. Um, the other thing to say is that we know nearly half of people who need mental health treatment aren't getting it. Um, and it's worse for racial and ethnic minority people. Those numbers are, are there's less access for those minority communities. So there's critical work for CBOs to do in increasing access and making the resources known. Yeah, we uh, for us, it's been kind of a patchwork approach because some of our communities are hard to reach. They're rural areas um, and there just aren't the providers uh, available yeah. or there's a backlog. Um, so, you know, we've kind of tried to adapt our outreach um, to be, to, you know, be a, a more supportive presence in the communities, uh, provide uh, spaces for gatherings and, you know, um, uh, conversations and, you know, just use that as kind of a healing uh, approach uh, while we're waiting to see what, you know, how we can better address the long-term effects of this. But, um, but yes, I mean, the mental health piece, I, I would also say that for us in the Latino community, um, one of the silver linings from the pandemic has been, it has brought it to the forefront where people are more willing to talk about mental health, uh, whereas they weren't uh, before the pandemic. It was still much more of a taboo issue, um, but because we've all been in the same boat together, you know, for such a long time now, yeah. um, I think people have, you know, kind of said, well, look, you know, we are struggling or my child is struggling or I'm struggling. Uh, where can I get help? Um, so that that has been good to see. Uh, it just it, it is difficult right now. I think um, you know with with the lack of providers and resources. So yeah. um, the yeah. Uh, addressing the chronic health conditions, uh, especially within uh, communities of color. You know we for for decades have seen uh, the issues of diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, you know, people not having um, home health, health homes uh, where they can uh, maintain the prevention piece of their health. Addressing with the health uh, conditions, the chronic health conditions is key, but do you believe more people are uh, open now to prioritizing their general health um, after the pandemic than they, than they were before? Or how are you seeing, you know, the public kind of responding to general health? needs. Yeah, I love this question because it really sees the opportunity in this moment. Um, because I feel very optimistic about the opportunities that we have to prioritize healthy lifestyle, chronic disease prevention, access to treatment for chronic conditions. 
um, in our public health practice and, and then in our, you know, our clinical um, practices. We saw during the pandemic a, a backslide in children getting essential vaccines and pregnant people getting prenatal care, mm-hmm. um, folks skipping preventative care appointments, cancer screenings, mammograms, pap smears, um, all of those really took took a back seat, you know. Um, and there was a, a study in California that's really interesting that said that saw a pap smear reduction by 80% wow. during the lockdown. Hmm. And then uh, an increase back to nearly normal rates following a reopening. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's very heartening. Uh, We haven't seen that in our childhood immunizations as a robust, um, a return to normal. And so that's really an area we need to focus on. Um, But we might see future research about health behavior um, intervention and pandemic impacts. Um, I think what we know for now is that with the preventative health backsliding, we're gaining ground. And that's that's great. We have work to do, but you know, we are moving in a positive direction. A um, couple of things we can do for improving access are, you know, telehealth expanded a lot during mm-hmm. the pandemic, um, including in you know mental health needs. And some of those expanded tools will continue even after the public health emergency ends on May 11th. Um, and that's especially true in mental and behavioral health, um, and rural and for rural areas, you know, those are real important there. Um, then, you know, the end of the public health emergency will have, you know, unwinding and we know that about 700, well, Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare, um, expects that about 700, 700,000 Texas Texans could lose Medicaid health insurance um, because the continuous enrollment period is ending. They had changed the rules and now the rules are reverting back to, to normal. Um, so a huge opportunity for CBOs is to really step in and share access to coverage opportunities. Um, remind people to look out for their renewal letter. That's a really important message. Um, update your contact information if it's changed, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, And if you're losing your Medicaid coverage, which some people will, um, then you, you know, we need CBOs to step in and try to connect folks with navigators to find new coverage. Yeah, that's a big one. I could totally see uh, the need for that, you know, um, uh, guidance from, you know, in this transition period overall is, um, you know, the, the, the impact, the power of presence, especially during a very scary time, like a pandemic has Mm -hmm. been, um, you know, it it was very revealing to us, you know, the importance of that connection, that human connection for people, and then being able to have those conversations and guide people down the right avenues has been very powerful. Um, So hopefully, yes, hopefully CBOs are able to continue that role, um, especially over the next year as people are transitioning, because that, that's a lot of folks. That, that's, you know, that's, that's a, a lot, lot of people. people. Yeah. 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 So, um, so how will we need to educate communities uh, on the importance of the vaccinations going forward? Um, and you just mentioned, you know, the, the end of the emergency um, uh, crisis uh, period in May. And so it's like, we're, we're going to be entering this period of, Access may be different. Um, uh, you know how our messaging may need to be changing. Um, but uh, what would be the 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 main things we need to be looking out for in messaging and in uh, connecting and making sure people realize that it's still important to get those vaccinations? Yeah, I mean, I can't say enough about trusted messengers. You know, you identify the. We have to know who are the people in our community that the community members trust. And oftentimes that those are people who are from the same place as we are. They look like us. They speak the same way we do. Um, that is just really, really critical. Um, the And then for everyone, um, that demonstrating cultural humility and just being on the journey of cultural humility, um, because you just have to meet people where they are. 
So listening first, finding out what the hesitancies are, what the um, what misinformation might be there. Um, yeah, and just co really confronting any misinformation that we find. That confronting misinformation, you know, that happens in my household, for example, and um, it's tough to do, you know, it's tough to look at your family member and say, well, that isn't exactly right. Um, but it's important to do because it has real impacts on, you know, whether or not they get a vaccine that will keep them healthy or, um, you know, decide to take a medication that doesn't help or, you know, all, all the various types of misinformation that we've seen. Absolutely. You know, a lot of our, um, uh, physician partners are, you know, they're, they're concerned about the long COVID and, you know, the impact on, on their patients and the health that they're, you know, the people that are, um, exhibiting, uh, you know, ongoing issues. Um, and we're still in that learning phase of, you know, what, how our bodies well, have responded and reacted absolutely. to this. And, um, so yes, I mean, I think that the, these are important pieces as, as far as, you know, continuing to promote, uh, the vaccinations and, and like you said, uh, combating the misinformation, uh, you know, because people will will inevitably try to attribute, you know, something to, you know, many many things and 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 uh, lead people down different roads. So, um, so yeah, the messaging huge, huge important piece. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do you think uh, will can help create a proactive culture of family health and uh, might be able to prepare us for future pandemics. Cause I know we don't want to talk about that. I want definitely, I don't want even want to think about that possibility right oh now. Yeah. Um, hopefully we get a breather and, and, you know, we can uh, adjust, but, but again, the lessons from this uh, situation, it's been a historic event, but uh, the lessons have taught us the importance of, being proactive in, in our healthcare, what uh, well, what do you think could, can help families, you know, prepare and manage that? Yeah, absolutely, Maria. I mean, so supporting healthy lifestyles, um, right? It's about changing our environments and the factors that impact our daily lives so that we can access healthier lifestyle options. So there's education, which is super important. It's important for us to know what to do, um, know what healthy lifestyles look like, but the environmental piece is just more often the barrier. Um, and when I say environmental, I mean um, access to safe places to uh, play and exercise or um, access to healthy foods. Um, yeah, working seatbelts in your car, you know, the kind of basic environmental influences on our health. Um, a few things that HHS is doing to kind of support healthy lifestyles, I, I just want to plug them. They have a, um, a Move Your Way campaign. Um, Move Your Way just supports physical activity, movement of all kinds, appropriate to all moments in the lifespan. Um, and they have materials for CBOs. So ideas for um, age and ability appropriate activity options. They also have a national youth sports strategy that's uh, focused on closing the gap uh, for kids to access um, opportunities to play sports. Then um, last year, the White House had a conference on hunger, nutrition, and health um, that we're seeing this year what's kind of the next steps from that. Uh, but there's a current opportunity to make a commitment in one of their pillar focus areas. So you can check that out and see, you know, where your CBO's mission might fit into um, the mission of addressing food security. Um, and then, you know, in our region, like out of our Dallas office for the, the region that I was describing, um, we really prioritize chronic disease and physical activity, chronic disease prevention and physical activity. Um, ensuring access to care. Those are just the surefire ways that we can get a better handle on health promotion. So, I mean, we're promoting health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not like rather than just the absence of disease. Yeah. Um, that's from the World Health Organization, that sort of um, 
framework, but it's a really important one to think about moving forward. Absolutely. Um, you know, we've we've honed in a lot on our cultural traditions and our outreach. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our ancestral indigenous customs um, have really come back to the forefront for us because because it is based so much on nature and being outside and, you know, eating healthy and being mindful of, you know, the plants and the, you know, the, 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 the benefits of nature in our, in our bodies and, and our nutrition. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of times we take for granted that um, whether it be the first generation immigrant uh, or children of immigrants that, that those customs are easy to hold on to people lose them you know and sometimes it's a matter of not like you said not having access to you know produce or you know natural um, mm -hmm. uh, foods and and so people kind of uh, slide into uh, unhealthy eating habits and and um, and so we you know we're, we're trying to you know reintroduce these concepts uh, in our groups and and encourage uh, exploration and learning, relearning of those traditions and how we can, you know, return to them, um, in our families. So, uh, that is so powerful. I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah. I think, you know, and it, and it, 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 I think for us, what we've seen is, you know, we've even incorporated because with COVID-19, there have been a lot of linger, people have had lingering issues with coughing or, you know, different types of people who suffer asthma or, you know, uh, starting to, try to make you right mm -hmm. fatigue. Um, so we're incorporating, incorporating stretching and breathing uh, workshops with our, um, you know, remedios, our natural remedies um, uh, discussions. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that this is relatable uh, on a cultural level. And so, um, yeah, but I, I think that that's, that's another big piece going forward uh, that I think both hits the the physical health and the mental health of, of our families. So yeah. uh, definitely. Um, are so there beautiful. any other emerging public health issues? I almost hate to ask you this question because I know there's always something, but um, you know, in addition to the ongoing chronic uh, issues that we, that we're seeing um, anything else that you feel that we should be paying attention to right now? Yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you mean about hating to ask this question, but um, there are priorities that we need to kind of focus on. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that came out of the pandemic is our understanding of what community health workers do for our communities and finding ways to sustain those programs when the um, kind of COVID-19 specific funding goes away. Community health worker programs tend to be grant funded, so that's you know, part of the challenge for their sustainability. Um, we're looking at that. We are also really focused right now on um, eliminating disparities in uh, maternal death and severe disease. You know, we see huge racial and ethnic um, disparities in that area, in our region and in our nation. Um, that is a huge project. Uh, a huge project for us right now is our Communities Improving Maternal Health Alliance that we're running out of um, Region 6 in collaboration with partners in other regions and HRSA and the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. It's a really big project with great partners, but um, it's really focused on trying to move the needle on eliminating those disparities. And then lastly, I would say, you know, the mental health piece that we spoke about is, is, um, so critical and the data are very alarming. So harm reduction, substance use disorders um, are a big focus. And then finally, <laughs> you get in the laundry list. Um, <laughs> finally, the health impacts of climate change and environmental justice. Those are those remain huge issues in our communities. Um, they were there before the pandemic and you know they're still with us. So some of these issues were highlighted or exacerbated by the pandemic and others were just, you know, finally returning our attention to um, existing needs. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, as you're talking about the maternal health, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up uh, because we, we definitely see that a lot, uh, you know, especially our young uh, first generation women, they don't have that support system that they may have had uh, in their homelands. And so, um, I, I just encounter so much. And I think that's, 
you know, in Texas, it's it's easy for people to kind of uh, assume that everyone has access or understands the process of, you know, how to take care of yourself and your uh, your baby and um, it, in that everyone's going to receive uh, automatically this, uh, this care. And that's not really the case. And uh, some uh, a lot of our women, uh, frankly, don't realize, you know, at what point they should go in to see a doctor. And, and sometimes they are waiting very long and, you know, while they're already you know, three or four months pregnant and um, uh, not sure how, you know, what the next steps are. They don't, they're lacking that kind of um, support system of other women that they, they benefited from, uh, in, you know, in, in countries that they came from. Um, mm. And so, and we're wondering, you know, what, what are, what's the impact of that on their children, right? On their daughters and, and their priorities of, of making decisions about their healthcare as women, going, you know, growing up and, and making uh, these these major life decisions and not knowing uh, the, the the proper protocol, you know, are, are we spending enough time uh, as communities and even as CBOs, you know, uh, taking for granted that people know this information and they don't. Yeah, yeah. No, access to maternal health care is a huge issue. And I think as we see, you know, more closings of rural hospitals, um, yeah we just, that's an area that we are really needing to dig into. So, um, a huge opportunity. Right. And, you know, I welcome everyone to check out our communities improving maternal health Alliance and, and join if they're interested. It's a, it's a great, um, group of people with a, a common mission. So wonderful. Wonderful. That would be a, a big, big piece, I think, for CBOs to, to be looking at and, and, uh, and our, you know, our communities to, consider um, taking on projects maybe at the local levels of, you know, uh, building these support networks among women uh, in, within the communities and, you know, uh, finding ways to to uh, encourage one another and support one an another and, and, you know, access information um, uh, that can provide, you know, that ongoing support. So, um, well, Ella, I mean, is there any other any any other points you would like to share with us or i mean we've covered some major major pieces that are extremely valuable i think that a lot of food for thought for communities and cbo's uh going forward uh but anything else um no thank you for this opportunity to speak with y'all and to share about you know our office the office of the assistant secretary of health um we're in dallas please contact us we're available to you know provide technical assistance, convening, connecting um, community partners to our federal partners and other community resources. So please be in touch. Absolutely. And I appreciate that. And I think that that's another big piece is uh, the collaborate co collaboration piece among uh, mm. community partners is continue that, uh, you know, find ways to to strengthen that on these different issues so that we can have healthier communities. So thank you so much, Ella. I appreciate you and I appreciate all the work that you've been doing. And thank you for being there for, for us and for, for the community. And uh, we wish you so much success moving forward uh, and hopefully uh, take a little break this year from some of the, the hectic uh, times of the pandemic. Same to you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. Appreciate y'all.